Welcome to this online lesson on homesteading. What factors affected settlement of the West? Here are a few do now tasks to get you started. There are some initials to give you a few clues as we might not have encountered these terms before. What law encouraged people to settle on the plains? Initials HA. What invention of 1874 made making fences cheaper and easier? BW. What might be a sod buster? P. And what invention made communication and transport far easier? R. If you want to have a go at guessing at some of those, or maybe even just using your own knowledge if you're revising this, then pause the video now and have a go. All right, the law that encouraged people to settle on the plains was the Homestead Act. The invention of 1874, well, there's a big clue up there. It's barbed wire. A sod buster, there's another clue, is a plough. And there's one at the top there as well. And what invention made communication and transport far easier? It was the railroads, or as we'd say in the UK, railways. So let's have a look first of all at the major development that got people out and settling on the West. The 1862 Homestead Act. Add this as a subheading. First of all, you need to record these facts about the Homestead Act. This is just the absolute basics of what you should know. The Homestead Act was passed in 1862 and it cost $10 for a homesteader to register. It gave 160 acres of land, which is equivalent to a quarter square mile, of free farmland to each homesteader who paid the registration fee. However, there was a catch. You had to successfully farm the land for five years in order to keep it. Once you had farmed it for five years, it was handed over to you. The government no longer owned it. It was yours. So this was a dream come true for many Americans who would never have been able to afford their own land, let alone their own entire farm in previous times. However, don't kid yourself that homesteading was an easy way to live. It absolutely wasn't. Also, don't think as well that it was actually something that was um, a large piece of land. This was not likely going to make you wealthy. I'll give you an example from personal experience. Canada also had a homestead act of its own. And in about 1911, there was a family from East Sussex who tried to register under the Canadian Homestead Act. The cost was also $10. The amount of land they were given was 160 acres of land, just like the American version, except this was a little bit later. Suffice to say that the family did not succeed. Their quarter mile of land later became a half, a half um, square mile of land, and even that wasn't enough. And so when the Great Depression hit in the 1920s, their youngest son, Percy, was sent back to England to live with some distant relatives. Good job he was. He was my granddad. So, let's have a look at the, an example of some host, homesteads. Check out this aerial photograph from Google Earth. This shows an area of America called Kansas. You'll notice that even the main roads are laid out on a sort of grid system. Now, what this looks like, despite the fact it's a little bit blurred, is it looks like there are different tiles of aerial photographs that have just been stitched together. So let's have a little bit of a closer look. It turns out that those are not tiles of photographs stuck together at all. They are real fields. Notice again just how regular this grid work is. The roads run exactly east-west and exactly north-south. Well, let's have a look at an individual plot. So, is this the size of a homestead? Again, the answer is no. A homestead was actually this size. So one of these big square units is one square mile, and one homestead was a quarter of a square mile. So actually, it's not a very big farm at all. You can just about see the ghostly remnants of where there were originally four fields here, which the, the farmers would use for rotation, maybe one for animals and one that was resting and another couple that were maybe uh, growing cereal grains or something like that. What's also quite interesting looking at these aerial photographs is you can see the reminders of where the original homesteads were. Here they are. So, although these might have been developed into slightly larger homesteads or larger farms now, or sometimes they're just left completely barren or with a bit of a rotting tractor in there, these days there is still an immense impact on the landscape of America, even when viewed from space. So these homesteads were an, an incredibly uh, significant idea. Also, the sheer number of them gives you an idea of just how much of the, the Great Plains was parceled up. Of course, the great losers from this eventually were the Indians. But we're going to consider today the homesteaders themselves and the challenges that they had to overcome. 
problems, consequences and solutions. Life on the plains for a homesteader was tough. Few were able to last the five years it took to be given the land. So first of all, let's consider the problems. Note down the headings, low rainfall, few trees and climate extremes. Once you've done that, you can complete the next bit. List the following facts under the correct headings. Few rivers, so too dry for the trees to grow. Very hot summers, half of the rainfall found in the east, hailstorms and thunderstorms, and the Plains Indians burnt down trees and to encourage grass to grow and support the buffalo. There are also few rivers and streams. And extremely cold winters. Here's a reminder of what the plains look like. Okay, pause the video here and note down those answers under the correct headings. So clearly there were some significant challenges to having a successful farm on the plains. So let's consider where those headings should have gone. Few rivers, so too dry for trees to grow. That might go under low rainfall, but also under few trees. Very hot summers relates to climate extremes. Half the rainfall found in the east means ro low rainfall. Hailstorms and thunderstorms, and occasionally tornadoes if you live in certain areas, well that relates to climate extremes. Plains Indians burnt down the trees to encourage grass and to support the buffalo relates to few trees. Few rivers and streams, that's all related to low rainfall, um, which means there was little water to, to drink or to, feed, or to give to your animals. And also extremely cold winters, this relates to climate extremes. So now we're going to consider exactly what consequences that had on the plains. Let's consider these consequences. Consider these examples and link each one to one of the problems that we previously identified about living on the plains. Too dry for crops, not enough water for livestock, hailstorms and fires from lightning destroyed crops, very difficult living conditions in both summer and winter, frequent droughts, no timber for building houses, no timber for making fences, no wood to burn for cooking and heating, and no rivers to transport people and products across the, uh, the plains. Often, this means that crops simply shriveled in the summer heat, so you probably didn't have anything to eat either. Sort out those under the right headings now. You can pause the video. Okay, let's move on. So, overcoming those problems. There were a variety of ways that people did it. One of the crucial ways is seen in this photograph, and that's called a sod house. A sod house is simply made from sods, which are cuts of turf. The plains grass tended to hold the mud together very strongly because of the, the deepness and thickness of the roots. That also made it a nightmare for ploughing. However, it could be cut into blocks and made into reasonable sun-baked bricks, as seen here. You can notice that this sod house has got a roof that's made of turf, and its sides are made of these sod bricks. This is actually a pretty upmarket example of a sod house. It's got proper windows, it's got a wooden door frame and wooden bits around the roof as well. Very few sod houses in the early period would have been anything like as sophisticated as this, as the only wooden components you would have would be what you could bring with you on your uh, wagon. However, this is a photograph from 1890, so this is after many of the challenges of settling on the plains had been solved. Let's identify a few of them. You should have your own copy of a picture of this Texas, home, uh, sorry, Kansas homestead. Um, you can find a copy of this linked in the description of this video. Label things that show that some of the plains problems were solved. For example, the chimney suggests that they had a fire. Settlers learned to, uh, to, uh, to burn buffalo dung or chips as they called them instead of wood. What problems and consequences have not been solved? If you're looking for more information as to how you might cover this, there's a link in the description to the BBC Bite Size uh, article on the homesteaders. The first two pages of this can provide you with all the information that you will need to complete this task. So maybe have a look there first before you start labelling your picture. Take the time necessary to do this and pause the video now. Okay, hopefully you've made some good notes based upon the BBC Bite Size article. Here's some basics that you should consider having on your, uh, on, on your photograph as a minimum. A water well with a winch. This could be up to 300 feet deep, so it was expensive and hard work to dig them, but very worthwhile if it provided a secure source of water. Remember there was low rainfall and few rivers. The sod house again, made from these sods of earth. 
These were actually pretty good for what they were. They were warm and fireproof, but they were filthy. It would took the uh, the housewife here, and remember this was a more sexist time in which women were expected to do this work and probably not a lot else, uh, spent an awful lot of time just keeping these places anywhere near uh, homely. Also, heavy rain could turn them back into mud, so they needed constant maintenance. Also for cart, for travelling around. Your nearest neighbours would be at least of a quarter of a mile away, but more likely many, many more miles than that. It wasn't unusual for a homesteader to live uh, at such a distance that they'd have to, have to travel for a whole day before they got any more human contact. And loneliness. Few, if any, other farmers in the area. Towns could be days travel away and other settlers might be quite a few hours or even a day too. So that's given you an example of some of the basic problems that were overcome. This is an opportunity to do a more complex uh, analysis of the different factors affecting settlement of the West. I've included on this screen some page numbers that relate to the Edexcel Pearson textbook, which has got the picture of Sitting Bull on the front of it. You could use this in order to research answers and make notes around these headings on these different factors. Alternatively, you could Google them and have a look at uh, adding some notes from that. However, what we should try and do is organise our different factors under different particular categories. So, in the blue region here, we've got things that relate to social and political reasons. These are all things that relate to people and power. Then we've got some technological developments and economic factors as well. These are in the sort of orangey colour. And in yellow, we've got military factors. Yes, the American Civil War and the freeing of the slaves that resulted from that affected the settlement of the West. So, as a revision task, you could do some research and complete a diagram like this of your own. Or, if you already feel confident on your knowledge for this, you can move straight on to the exam-based question, which will be coming next. But remember, you will not be able to attempt the exam-based question until you've got at least some basic knowledge of some of these factors. So, pause the video now if you want to complete this task, or if you're going to proceed straight on to the exam task, then just wait. And you didn't have to wait very long. This is what's called a narrative account style question. Write a narrative account analysing the ways in which the West was settled in the 1860s. Eight marks. Let's first of all consider the wording of that question. A narrative account is basically a story. So think about this. A narrator tells the story, a bit like I'm doing now, and a narrative account is also a telling of a story. That means it needs to go in chronological order. So you include the earliest examples first and then work your way through to the later ones. However, you're not just telling the story, this story is analysing the ways in which the West was settled. In other words, you're explaining them and explaining how they relate to each other. You're looking for links, basically. Here's the preparation then. Choose three events or developments, either from the diagram that you produced earlier or from your own knowledge. Put them in chronological or time order. For example, you might start with the Homestead Act of 1862. Then consider how they link together. Does one event lead to another? If it doesn't, then maybe choose another development or event. Then when you write your answer, you make a point using a linking sentence starter. So this linking sentence starter might be firstly, if you're just starting your answer off, or this led to, or this, or consequently, or as a result. Then you could give an example. Give an example of what happened. This may be within your point sentence. It doesn't matter really. Then you explain the effects of your example. What did it do? And then you link it. Explain how this led to settlement of the West. And that's where you're going to be ensuring that you're analysing the ways that these that settlement happened in the West. Then you repeat this for the three events or developments that you chose and then conclude. You can conclude by saying the most important development was because or these developments are linked by because. All right, have a go at that. And if you want to do your preparation now, you should be ready to start your answer. In a few moments, I'm going to be showing an example of how you might write the start of this answer if you're really unfamiliar with it. So if you want to increase your challenge level, have a go by pausing the video now before that, uh, that screen appears. OK, if you're a bit uh, um, challenged by these narrative account questions, and they aren't easy, they don't tend to go down too well in many uh, candidates' work, um, this is an opportunity to have a look at the start of an example. Firstly, the US government passed the Homestead Act of 1862. That's made my point in my example. 
This act gave 160 acres of land to anyone willing to set up a farm on the plains. If they succeeded in farming the land for five years, they got to keep it. Then the link. This led to settlement of the West because people saw it as an opportunity to own land and make a fresh start in the West. Then I've got another, uh, another paragraph beginning. This led to immigration from Europe. European immigrants were attracted to settle in the West by the Homestead Act and the prospect of owning their own land. I then continue that by linking that to how that encouraged settlement of the West. Hopefully you get the idea now. So without further ado, pause the video now and have a go at this answer. It should take you about 15 minutes. All right, let's see how you got on. Here's an example answer. OK, here's the example answer. And I've taken all of my examples from the 1860s to fit in with the question. Just be careful you've done the same. Firstly, the US government passed the Homestead Act in 1862. That's my point and example. This act gave 160 acres of land to anyone willing to set up a farm on a plains. If they succeeded in farming the land for five years, they got to keep it. That's provided some extra detail and explanation. And now I link back to this analysis. This led to settlement of the West because people saw it as an opportunity to own land and make a fresh start in the West. This led to immigration from Europe. European immigration immigrants were uh, attracted to settle in the West by the Homestead Act and by the prospect of owning their own land. This led to settlement of the West as newly arrived European immigrants were attracted to become farmers using the Homestead Act rather than live in the overcrowded cities of the Eastern USA. I'll just point out that that's exactly the process that um, some members of my family took way back in the 1910s, although of course that was in Canada rather than the USA. Consequently, there was a need for better transport. The Pacific Railroad Act of 1862 enabled this as it allowed the, involved the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. This led to increased settlement as people and goods could be transported into areas before, where the homesteads were being constructed more quickly and safely than before. Now, I could also add here that the, homes, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, and so that does still fit within the 1860s remit of this question. Right, so what have I missed? That's right, I need a conclusion. Overall, the most important development was the Homestead Act. This is because it had a knock-on effect on later immigration and the need to construct the Transcontinental Railroad. This in turn led to a huge increase in the number of settlers moving west. Ta-da! That's it. So, narrative accounts are questions that my students often find quite difficult, but if you, if you look at it, I've, all I've done is taken a basic chronological approach, I've chosen three linked examples, and then summed them up at the end. It really isn't as difficult as we can often convince ourselves. You are telling a story, but it's one that explains the links. And on that note, the lesson is at an end. Thanks very much for watching it. I hope it's been helpful and useful to you. If it has, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much, and goodbye!